Hey everyone, so I'm just going to start here with a quick introduction in case anyone doesn't know me. My name is Connor. Back in 2016, I actually graduated with a Doctor of Pharmacy degree in my home state of Ohio before moving out to Arizona to work as a pharmacist. But unfortunately, pretty quickly after I started, I realized it was not what I wanted to do long term. Uh, luckily, after two years of working, I was fortunate enough to join the uh, class of 2022 at the RVU Utah campus, which is pretty nice. I am pretty sure that I do want to teach at some point in my career. And so with Dr. Jensen and Dr. Zong's approval, they're allowing me to make a quick video lecture series that mirror and kind of supplement what they're teaching during the first week of Renal 2 when we come back from summer break. Uh, the very first of those lectures is actually pharmacodynamics given by Dr. Zong. A uh, quick disclaimer, I don't know any of the test questions that they're going to be asking. I don't know even how they're going to be delivering these lectures. Uh, but what I do know and what they have provided me is their lecture slides and more importantly, their lecture objectives. And so I'm going to kind of hit their lecture objectives one by one. I'll try and stick in as closely to the lecture that they provided as uh, closely as I can but kind of giving my own spin on things as well. And if you find this helpful, that'll be awesome. But if not, at least I'll get some teaching experience out of it. Uh, so with that out of the way, let's begin. I'm going to start it off with two quick definitions here. The first one is the definition of pharmacodynamics. Those are the drug's effects on the body, and those can be both therapeutic and toxic effects. So does the drug uh, lower your blood pressure? Does it lower your blood sugar? Those would be the therapeutic effects of the drug, and so that would be a pharmacodynamic principle. It can also be, does the drug give you a headache, or does the drug... Uh, cause you to break out in a rash. Those are, are toxic effects of the drugs still under pharmacodynamics. Pharmacokinetics is how the body's, uh, the body's effects on the drug. So does the drug uh, get metabolized by the liver? Does the drug uh, get excreted by the kidneys? What, what does your body do to the drug, right? And so those ones, they're very, very fine points and they're easy questions to miss if you don't pay attention to the small details, but they're also very easy points to pick up. The way that I kind of remember that is you look at pharmacodynamics, it's got D for dynamics. The definition's got the one that starts with the D in it for drugs. Whereas pharmacokinetics is the exact opposite of that. We're going to go into pharmacokinetics a little bit more later, but essentially when you think of pharmacokinetics, think of ADME properties or A-D-M-E. A is for absorption, D for distribution, M for metabolism, and E for elimination. Okay, a couple more definitions here, and these ones are a little bit more high yield than the previous two, and that's the definitions of agonist versus antagonist. An agonist, just generally speaking, is any molecule or substance that when bound to a receptor causes some sort of physiological response at that receptor, and it can be both positive or negative responses, we'll find out, but some sort of response above or below the baseline of that receptor. So we have three different subtypes of agonist. The first one is a full agonist. Full agonist is a molecule that when it binds to a receptor, you get a maximal effect of that receptor, or 100%. You can't uh, bind any other molecule and get anything above what you would get if that molecule bound. A good example of this is fentanyl. When fentanyl binds to the opioid receptor or the mu receptor in the body, you're going to get 100% response. The second type is a partial agonist, and a partial agonist activates a receptor, but only to a sub-maximal effect. So that's anything that would be greater than like 1% of that receptor, but less than 100%. So for my examples going forward, and this is just a random number just to make things easier, I'm going to say a partial agonist activates a receptor to 50% response. So it can go higher if a different molecule are bound to it, but this molecule in particular only bound only activates the receptor to 50%. And a good example of this one is buprenorphine, if we're sticking with the opioid example particularly. Buprenorphine is, is a well-known partial agonist and one that you should remember going forward as well. The last one that we have is inverse agonist. Inverse agonist is something that inhibits something called the constitutive activity of the receptor. So sometimes a receptor has some sort of activity going on, even when a molecule or some sort of ligand is not bound to it. So when there's no other external influences, that receptor is still uh, having some sort of physiological response. An inverse agonist will inhibit that natural or that baseline physiological response. And if that doesn't make sense to you, that's okay, because it makes a little bit more sense when you look at it graphically. So let's go to that now. 
So this is a good graphical representation of the three different agonists that we have. So on the x-axis here, we have dose of the medication. As you go further along the x-axis, you have increasing dose. And then on the y-axis here, you have activity level at that particular receptor. So let's look at the full agonist. Full agonist, again, those go all the way up to 100% at, at some dose. It doesn't need to be at any particular dose, but at some point, they reach 100% activity over here, and that, that's what makes the full agonist, if, is if it can reach that level. Partial agonist, remember, it's never going to get up to 100%. This graph's a little misleading. If you keep going, this will taper off at some point um, because it cannot reach 100% in order to be, by definition, a partial agonist, so it does have to taper off. Um, so if we're sticking with our example, the partial agonist here will get you to 50% activity level. And the last one here is our inverse agonist. It says the constituent activity of this receptor right here is defined by uh, the dotted line at zero. So anything that brings you below that constitutive activity is going to be your inverse agonist. And that could be anywhere below this level. So it could be anywhere from, from you know, negative one really up to negative 100% activity. Um, and that would make it your inverse agonist. So just know that anything, really any time constitutive activity is brought up, you're probably talking about inverse agonist because there's nothing that really enhances the constitutive there's, there's by definition no real way to enhance the constitutive activity uh, with a, a chemical mediator only only decrease it so when you're talking about constitutive activity just know you're talking about inverse agonist in those scenarios okay in the second set of definitions here with our antagonists antagonists are anything that blocks the action of a drug they don't have any intrinsic activity of their own though and there's two different types of, comp or of of antagonists the first one is competitive antagonist that's something that can be overcome with increasing doses of your agonist so if you give a competitive antagonist it's going to block the action of your agonist um, so we'll think of naloxone in this case. If you give naloxone, it's going to block the action of fentanyl, an opioid agonist versus an opioid antagonist. But if you give enough fentanyl, fentanyl can still reach 100% of its activity like it did if the competitive antagonist had not been there. It just requires higher doses at this point. So competitive antagonists can be overcome. Then there's non-competitive antagonists, and no matter how much fentanyl you give, you're not going to be able to overcome a non-competitive antagonist. And so let's look at what those look like on the graph as well. So back to our same graph here, um, antagonist is right here, and if you notice that just maintains whatever the constitutive activity of that uh, receptor normally would be. It doesn't increase it, it doesn't decrease it, it just maintains uh, whatever it was, and then it would go on to block the actions of really all of those by either kind of clogging up the receptor or changing the, the shape or the conformation of the receptor itself. Um, but whatever you're looking at, it's looking to maintain kind of that status quo line right here for antagonists. And we'll look at a couple different graphs of how you can plot uh, both competitive and non-competitive antagonists, but we'll need a different type of graph for that. And this is what that other chart looks like. This is the dose response curve, or the DRC for short. Uh, one important thing to note, and the DRC or dose response curve only needs one subject to produce it. That's something that I think will be stressed on in class and something that I wanted to hit on here. Uh, dose response curves look at on the x-axis the dose of the drug. Here we've got the log of the dose of the drug and that just helps produce this nice curve but otherwise is somewhat meaningless. So if you just think of dose on the x-axis, x-axis, that's fine. Then on the y-axis, we've got a response of that drug in a human um, and or, or in an animal. But, but in this case, we're looking at some sort of biological function usually. So on our y-axis, we're looking at heart rate as our uh, response. And so the first thing that we can look at when looking at the dose response curves is efficacy. Efficacy is the ability of the drug to produce that desired response or, or that undesired response, but produce some sort of response in our subject. So in our chart again, that's how well the drug will be able to change or increase the heart rate of our subject. So if we look at drugs A, B, and C, they all change or increase the heart rate by 100% at some point of their dosing interval, which means that their efficacy would all be equal. Drug D only increases the heart rate by about 50%. 
And so drug D would be the least efficacious, efficacious out of all four of these drugs. And so the the only thing that you need to look at for efficacy is how high or low that drug can get on the y-axis at any point on the x-axis, very independent of the dose. So if it can reach 100% at any point, we're considering those equal in terms of efficacy. The second thing that we can look at for drugs on the DRC is for potency. Potency is at what dose uh, the drug is able to produce its desired response. And so for this one, we're looking very much at the x-axis. And so we can compare drugs A, B, and C. And since drug A reaches 100% of its response at a much lower dose than drug C does, drug C, you need to wait till you're 10 to the negative 2, uh, whatever units that is, to get to 100%. That means drug C would be less potent than drug A. And so looking at the x-axis, we can determine potency. And the closer we get to zero, a right around here, the more potent the drug is going to be. And then for um, the y-axis, the higher we can get, the more efficacious the drug is going to be. A couple other things that we can determine when we're looking at the uh, DRC here is something called the um, ED50 which is the effective dose at which you get 50% maximal response of that particular drug. And so if we look at drug A, I drew that line, right, line wrong. So if we draw A and look at the 50% response, we draw that down here, that's your effective dose, 50%. If you look at drug C, that's 50% of response there. So 10 to the negative three would be our ED50, or effective dose at which 50% maximal response is reached. And we can do that with drug D as well. It doesn't reach 100, but remember it reaches 50%. So if we take half of 50, we look at the 25% mark, draw that down. Again, 10 to the negative 3 would be the same ED50. Even though it doesn't reach the same 100% mark, it doesn't matter for the definition of ED50. One other thing that we can look at is which of these drugs would be a full agonist versus partial agonist since drugs A, B, and C all reach 100%. They would all be considered full agonists in this case. Drug D, since it only reaches about 50%, that would likely be considered our partial agonist. Okay, the next thing that we can look at using the DRC or the dose response curve is how a full agonist will be affected when given with a competitive or a non-competitive antagonist. And so in this case, this particular graph, we're looking at a full agonist plus a competitive antagonist. And let's review that really quick here. So the definition of full agonist, anything that can achieve 100% response in your body. And so this line here, the blue line gets up to 100%. So you know that you're dealing with a full agonist. A competitive antagonist, we said, was anything that can be, that does inhibit the receptor, but can be overcome with increasing doses of a full agonist. And so that's what the graph is looking at here. Before we go a little bit more to the graph, I wanna show this as a picture. And on the side of the picture here, I've driven, drawn uh, four different receptors, and that, that will just uh, signify the only four receptors you have in your body for heart rate or something like that, right? And so if you bind all four of these receptors with your full agonist, you're going to get 100% of your body's response. You're going to increase your, your heart rate by, you know, whatever percentage. And let's say we'll give a non, or sorry, a competitive antagonist. Now what a competitive antagonist does is it'll just kind of bind to this receptor and it'll sit there and it won't let anything else bind. So let's, let's have those on there now. So now we'll give, instead of four molecules of our drug to get to maximum response, we're gonna need more because if we give just our regular four, they're gonna come in here and they're gonna get kind of booted away because they're not gonna be able to overcome the competitive antagonist already sitting on there. Instead, what you're gonna need is, uh, we'll say, you know, three more molecules each per receptor to kind of uh, provide enough uh, driving force to kick that competitive antagonist off and then allow the full agonist to bind. And so um, with increasing doses, we can overcome the competitive antagonist. And that's exactly what's shown here on the graph. We can still get to 100% response. It's just gonna take a higher dose 
to get to that response. And so we can look at a couple different markers that help tell us that. The first one is EC50. EC50 is very, very similar to ED50, and you can kind of use them interchangeably. Uh, EC50 stands for the effective concentration at which 50% the maximal response is reached, as opposed to ED50, which was the effective dose. Since with increasing doses, you get increasing concentrations, they're very, very similar, and a lot of times we'll use them um, kind of interchangeably when just discussing things. So just think of those as, as interchangeable for, for the time being. So the EC50 is going to increase, right? Because uh, in order to get to 50% our maximum response, we're going to have to give increasing doses of our drugs. So that's the first thing that we can look at. With a competitive antagonist, you're going to have an increased EC or ED50. The next thing that we can look at is efficacy. And remember I said efficacy is on the y-axis. Since we're dealing with full agonists, everything that's below 100% would be considered a decrease in efficacy. Since in this case, we're still able to reach 100%, efficacy is going to stay the same. And so that's the next marker that we can kind of look at. The last thing that we can look at is our potency. And remember I said potency was on the x-axis more or less. And uh, since we're moving away from zero, since it's taking increasing doses to get to 100%, that means we're going to have a decrease in our potency. We're going to need more drug to elicit the same response. So that's a decrease in potency. Okay, and so that was a competitive antagonist when combined with a full agonist. Now we're going to look at a non-competitive antagonist. Remember, a non-competitive antagonist is something that cannot be overcome no matter how much the full agonist you give. And again, the chart will reflect that. And again, one more time, we'll kind of look at that graph or, or pictorially as well. So again, we've got our same thing here. If we had four molecules of our drug in our system, all those are going to bind and we're going to reach 100%, right? So... What happens when you give a non-competitive antagonist is if you, um, and there's a couple different types of non-competitive antagonists, but generally speaking, what it's going to do is either going to bind to the active site of the molecule and it just will not move no matter what because it, it's bound so strongly, or it's going to bind to a site other than the uh, active site of that molecule and it'll just cause some sort of conformational change. Um, either way, no matter what you do, when you get your full agonist on board, it will not be able to bind. And no matter how much of the drug you have sitting around, it's not going to make any sort of difference at all. You're still not going to be able to bind to either of those receptors. And so that's a non-competitive antagonist. Now, if we look at that at the chart, because we can no longer bind to these two receptors out of the four, let's say they, they're for all intents and purposes, we're just taking those two out of the picture completely. Now we can only re reach 50% our body's maximal response because we only have two receptors left. And so you're never going to be able to get to 100% effect anymore. So you're going to shift your curve down on the y-axis. And remember, anytime we shift our curve down on the y-axis, you're going to be decreasing your drug's efficacy because that's solely dependent on the y-axis. We're not changing anything on the x-axis, though, because our EC50, or again, our ED50, is going to remain the same. And with it remaining the same, that means we're going to have equal potency of that drug. So the receptors that we do have left, number one and number two here, your drug is having no problem binding to those, and so the potency is not going to change at all. The last thing that we can look at, again, is the EC50. EC50, again, in this case, does not change. And so those are the three markers that we can look at when a full agonist is combined with a non-competitive antagonist. Okay, and this is a very standard quantal dose response curve. Just one more time here. Quantal dose response curves is done in a group of people or a population of people. Regular dose response curve is done in a single candidate or a single uh, test subject. So let's dive into this one here. So this one, again, we're plotting our therapeutic effects, in this case, hypnosis. So this would be a drug that would be used for insomnia, something like Ambien in this case. Um, and then we also plot the toxic, or, or in this case, lethal effects of the drug, and so that would be death. And since we know that we're dealing with death here, we're, we're definitely testing this on animals and not humans. And what we can do is we can get the therapeutic index of the drug. The therapeutic index is essentially saying, how many degrees of separation do I have between 
my therapeutic effects and my toxic or lethal effects of the drug. And so we plot, or, or the actual equation for it is the LD50, which is the dose at which 50% of the people die from that, which in our case would be right about here, 400 uh, micrograms per kilogram, versus or over our ED50, which is the dose at which 50% of the people get the beneficial response of the drug or the hypnotic effects of the drug. So that would be right here. So that would be 100. So that's our ED50. So LD50 divided by ED50, or lethal dose divided by effective dose, equals our therapeutic index. And that would be 4 in this case. The higher the therapeutic index, that means the greater degrees of separation you have between your therapeutic effect and your toxic effects. So a higher therapeutic index is a better thing when dealing with medications because that means we have bigger room for dosing. We can dose the medication up to a higher uh, degree or higher concentration without having to worry about the lethal or toxic effects. So that's therapeutic index. Very different from therapeutic window. So let's look at what therapeutic window looks like. Okay, so let's look at therapeutic window now. And therapeutic window is a little bit more informative, in my opinion, than therapeutic index. Therapeutic index just kind of gives us a general idea of the relative safety of the drug. The higher the number, relatively the more safe our drug is. But it doesn't really give you anything specific. Therapeutic window will give you a little bit more of the specifics, which I like. So what we do, and this is another quantile dose response curve, because we're plotting the therapeutic effects of our drug against the lethal or in this case, toxic effects of our drug. And uh, we kind of look at, again, the degrees of separation of these two things. But what we're doing this time is we're looking at these kind of subjective markers of minimum therapeutic effect and minimum tolerable adverse effects. So let's start at minimum therapeutic effect. This is the dose at which we start to see our beneficial response in our patient population. So the dose at which we start to see that, or in this case, the concentration in which we start to see the beneficial effects of our drug is eight. So we write eight down, that's our first number. The second number is the dose at which we start to get uh, serious adverse events in our population, and that's 18, so that's our second number, and that's our therapeutic window right there. The dose at which we start to see the beneficial effects up to the dose at which we start to see our toxic effects of the drug, and again, these are very, very subjective. 8 and 18 will not be something, or, or sorry, the minimum tolerable adverse effect dose and then the minimum therapeutic effect dose are not something you're going to have to come up with on your own. It's something that will be given to you because they're very subjective. The minimum tolerable adverse effect for headache is going to be much higher. We're going to be able to tolerate more people having a headache than we would something like hypoglycemia, which is inherently much more dangerous. And so these are very, very subjective and nothing you'll have to come up with yourself. But what you do need to know is that when you're given these numbers, therapeutic window is a range of these numbers. So eight to 18. Therapeutic index, the one that we looked at previously, was just a, a number. It's going to be one, it's going to be two, it's going to be three, four, it's going to be 5.8 or whatever it is, but it's not going to be a range like therapeutic window is. And when we're looking at therapeutic window, one of the really the best things that we can get from this is is we can start to determine what our dosing range of the drug is so the minimum dose at which i start to see a beneficial effect is going to be the lowest dose i'm going to give in my patient population and then the dose at which we start to see serious adverse events is going to be my maximum dose for that uh, drug and so we can start to get our dosing range of the drug here and that's our therapeutic window Okay, and that was the very, very brief overview of pharmacodynamics. This was not all-encompassing of the lecture, and it was not all-encompassing of pharmacodynamics at all. So if there's anything out there that's still kind of a sticking point for you guys or still very confusing, feel free to message me. Um, I can try to even make another video or two to help explain uh, you know, certain topics as we go forward here and through the course. Um, hopefully you liked it and hopefully I'll see you for the next video, which is drug development and then jump in a little bit into the pharmacokinetics as well.